So it's entitled Form and Function of the Developing Heart, but we will also hear some work that actually is um, about the adult heart. But before I start with all that, uh, let me first introduce you um, about developmental biology, which is actually my, my major profession or um, the subject uh, of most of my scientific life, particularly after Michael. And developmental biology deals with the question how animals or plants develop. And certainly this is a very complex, uh, there will be a complex answer to this simple question because I mean the whole thing starts as a single fertilized cell, the egg, which initially only starts to do some, some, some cell divisions. But out of the cell divisions, by cell migration, differential cell adhesion, and many different other processes, an embryo is generated. And this embryo, with all these different parts of organ primordia, then will go on and form an, an adult organism, which then, by, <coughs> by fertilization, generates a new generation. And this is a, a miraculous process which fascinates people over many centuries from Aristotle uh, until now, and it also captured my interest. To uh, tell you a bit about the, uh, the way that I took, Kim already told you a bit about it, but I simply thought to uh, also illustrate uh, <clears throat> the whole process. So I started out um, as a boy in Hamm in Westphalia, which is a middle-sized town in, in, in North Rhine-Westphalia, which is a rather industrialized uh, area. And here I actually started to shape my interest in biology, and initially I wanted to become a forester, and having an aquarium at home and playing around with uh, reptiles and also meeting um, a teacher act, uh, working on insects, I initially then decided to become a biologist, but rather than working on heart development, initially I was more interested in Konrad Lorenz and animal behavior, and actually that was the initial plan to do uh, some work in animal behavior. Well, I moved then to the University of Bielefeld to do uh, my studies. Bielefeld is a middle-sized town, about 80 kilometers uh, away from my hometown, and here I did my diploma, and which was a very decisive point already, a diploma with Harald Jukic, which is a muscle researcher, mostly interested or was interested in myotonia, in muscle disease. But he happened to also, on the side, work a little bit on, on heart. And uh, I did then with him um, a study, which actually was then also published, uh, on the differential pro protein products of atria and ventricular cells, which we were isolating from neonatal rats, and, um, and obviously the differential expression of certain proteins are maintained when you place those cells in culture, so there's a stable difference in atrial and ventricular myocytes when you take them out of the myocardium. But what happened also was that I came into contact with uh, very impressive people like um, <clears throat> Katie Schwartz, where I actually spent um, two weeks in, in the lab in, in, in the Hospital La Riboisea, and I also worked with uh, Wolfgang Forsmann, who just discovered, among other people, the atrial natriuretic peptide. And I was then working on vis visualizing and staining cardiac myocytes and looking for the differential distribution of natriuretic peptide protein in cardiac myocytes. This work then led me to the next move, which is I worked then at the Max Planck Institute in Bad Nauheim under the guidance of Wolfgang Schaper, um, a researcher mainly interested in cardiac, in angiogenesis and uh, ischemia-related collateral formation. Um, and, but my subject was a bit different from what the mainstream was doing in the lab, and I worked on cardiac hypertrophy. And it was a time where molecular biology actually entered uh, heart research. I mean, <clears throat> it was more or less a transition where people before mostly did protein biochemistry and all of a sudden molecular biology, cloning of genes and expression studies started um, in, in this area. And so we did uh, research <clears throat> uh, on, in cardiac hypertrophy and studied the expression of C4, C milk and other um, uh, fast uh, 
acting nuclear proton genes. But uh, I also published uh, a paper then in Circulation Research, which is one of the highly cited paper of mine until now, which is only northern blots, but it was one of the first studies analyzing cardiac ischemia and the effect on transcriptional activity, which uh, obviously until now even catches the interest of certain researchers. Well, the uh, work in Wolfgang Scharper's lab was sufficiently good that I was uh, daring to uh, enter into a competition and which he actually won. It was a, um, a competition from the International Society of Heart Research where I spent some time here in this fantastic um, hotel. And I, I gave here, this is the time when I gave this speech. And I entered and then finally I was uh, rewarded um, with this prize. The worrying thing about it is that I was told with one, by one of the competitors that those people that succeed winning this prize are normally destined to never uh, to disappear because they normally no longer uh, will be uh, any, any more successful. So there was somehow, uh, somehow something like a curse that was lying on me. And so I looked for somebody that maybe could free me. And, and this was Michael because I have subsequently went uh, from 1991 to 94 to the Baylor College of Medicine um, and worked with Michael. And here's a picture of him when we, uh, when we were, were on a <coughs> Keystone conference in Taos and we had a day out and I'm pretty sure you remember that where we spent some time together and uh, drove around. <coughs> anyway, with Michael I did work on the TGF beta receptors and particularly developed um, mutants that are able to interfere with TGF beta signaling and both dominant negative type 1 and type 2 receptor mutants were generated and leading to the publication that uh, are here on the wall. After my time then in Michael's lab, I moved to the University of Braunschweig and actually this was a, um, a point of uh, which was de quite decisive again. Braunschweig is here in the middle of, of Germany, of the United Germany. Braunschweig, um, <coughs> there worked uh, Hans Henning Arnold, and he made his uh, name of fame with isolating myogenic transcription factor. So the myogenic transcription factor MIF5 was isolated in his lab, and when I entered the lab, we were looking to find something similar for the myocardium. So is there something like a cardiogenic transcription factor, a central one that would convert any cell into a cardiac myocyte? Well, until now, this hasn't been found, and I didn't find it, but I cloned uh, one of the NK box, homeo box genes, NKX2.8, which was the first paper that I was able to publish in that lab. But what you can maybe able to notice is that this demarcates also the transition because all of a sudden now I'm using the chick embryo as a model system, which before I always worked with mammalian systems. The chick is a great model system because you can manipulate um, in a rather large embryo and you can um, manipulate uh, uh, taking out cells, placing cells in, and, uh, and, and so it's, it's a great model system where you have direct hands-on. It, it's not so good if you want to do genetics. There are much better systems like fish or, or the mouse system. But I mean, to starting off or for teaching, it's a, it's a fantastic model system. And also for certain questions, um, as we will demonstrate, it's until now a, a fantastic model system. So we started out to work on cardiac induction and that um, I'm trying here to visualize now. So, this is a chick embryo during, early, uh, uh, during, the, during the early stages of heart formation. So initially, <clears throat> at about 24 hours after um, the egg is incubated, there will be two pieces, two fields uh, uh, of heart, heart forming fields on the left and the right side. So these heart forming fields are specified to become cardiac mesoderm, and they will mi migrate anterior and will move, uh, will then meet in the middle and then subsequently start to fuse and generate a tube, a heart tube. And this heart tube, in about a few hours later, starts to uh, deform further to bulge out towards the right side and the myocardium starts to contract. So the whole process uh, 
of specification and formation of the myocardium takes about a day in the, in the chick embryo. And <clears throat> we were particularly interested in this first step. So what actually decides where in the embryo a heart will form? And this is a, a typical question that is asked in developmental biology. What is inducing, um, uh, what kind of signals are inducing a particular structure? And what is shown here is um, a depiction of an of a chick embryo where you can see the process of gastrulation in this embryo where cells are uh, migrating from the outer side of the embryo into the uh, inner lumen. And, and these cells, the red cells, become then the mesoderm, which is then forming, among other stuff, the heart. And the yellow cells underneath becoming then later the gut tube. <clears throat> And the process the, of determination what the cells become is determined by their migration paths. So cells that migrate in, in this area here will be, become into, will be become exposed to a set of signaling molecules which are turning on then the program of forming, um, forming a, a heart. And to find out what kind of factors might be responsible, of course, Drosophila is an actually wonderful system. And around the time when I entered um, the lab in Braunschweig, there was a fantastic publication by Manfred Frasch that in Drosophila, in the fly, which also has a heart, very simple, but nonetheless it has a heart, requires the signal DPP. And that was, of course, um, quite exciting. And, of course, then we asked, are the same molecules also active in, in the vertebrate embryo. And so what is DPP? Well, DPP is a member of the TGF-beta superfamily, and, and here is DPP. And the closest homologs in vertebrates are called BMP2 and BMP4. And so we cloned those BMP2 and BMP4 and asked where are they in the embryo. And they are exactly where they're supposed to be to be cardiogenic inducers. And they are always adjacent to the actual heart field. So here's the expression domain of the BMP, and here would be the area where the heart will form. And so they're always adjacent, just adjacent to the cells that will go and to make heart. So we then ask the question, are they active? And to do so, we use some cells that we implanted adjacent to the area where the heart will form, and if we do so, we can see that extra myocardium is formed. So this is a staining reaction where we can uh, identify those, those cells that are destined to become hard. And you can see that always adjacent to the, to the implant where BMP is produced, you see some extra cells that are forming myocardium. So this was the first evidence heart is formed by BMP2. Another example is here where we excise a piece of tissue place it in culture and at this single growth factor. And this single growth factor is able to induce a battery of cardiac transcription factors, which are all named here. This is uh, um, without the growth factor, and this is with this growth factor. So it's a massive induction of a wide variety of genes, all with a single growth factor, which is sufficient to instruct these cells to become myocardium. Well, all this has been published. I'm just introducing the people that did the work. Birgit Andre and Thomas Schlange uh, both uh, contributed. And uh, it was only an MOD, both papers, but nonetheless, they, they are highly cited until today. Um, well, of course, this is not a single factor. I mean, cardiac induction is very complex. And this is just a, a scheme that I published in 2003. What was known at that time is clearly depending on concentration, on timing, different sets of growth factors are inducing at different time points. And we only identified one factor of probably a, a dozen or so that are required to actually convert mesoderm into to the uh, myocardium. But nonetheless, what I want to make a point here is certainly the trick embryo is a worthwhile system to work out those factors. So the next step is we have now studied a little bit about what kind of signaling molecules are required to make myocardium. But now the myocardium initially that is formed is not the in, in its final form. Um, 
This is illustrated here because the initial first stage is just a linear hard tube. A very simple structure which is sufficient if you would be a fly. But it's not sufficient if you are a growing mouse embryo because then the pumping activity in this organ is so low that when a certain size is, um, um, is reached, then this heart is no longer sufficient to supply the organism with sufficient amount of oxygen and nutrients. What happens is that chambers are formed, and chambers, the, the chambers are formed in a process that is called heart looping. So what you have is initially a rather straight heart tube that all of a sudden then bulges toward the right side, and then this result, results in, in a, in a um, repositioning of the initial inflow tract, which is at the caudal end, and then will be placed subsequently towards the anterior end of the, of the heart. And this is an ongoing process, which is uh, rather too complicated to be explained here in this inaugural, just that you get a glimpse and idea what, what is involved. Underneath this process of asymmetric morphogenesis is a signal transduction pathway involving quite a number of different genes. And I'm just depicting a few of them here. There's a signaling that involves the midline, and from the midline there's an asymmetric distribution of an important TGF beta superfamily member called nodal. And nodal is, is accumulating on the left side at higher levels than on the right side. So as you can see this here, on the left side it's higher than on the right side. And this left-sided increase of this growth factor leads then to a massive upregulation at, at a certain distance. And this is in, in this distance, this area here is where also the, my, the myocardial precursors are localized. And then this growth factor is then activated here, leading then to the activation of a transcription factor called PITX2, which then determines that this side becomes the left side of the embryo. PITX2 is but also an important gene that later in, in, in life plays an important role. It has been recently, for example, associated with atrial fibrillation. So something to, to where you can understand that studying development may still have an impact for adult cardiologists. So our, our contribution among different things were, for example, the study of a gene called CFC. CFC is a, is a competence factor. I'm just switching over. A competence factor which needs to be present at the cell membrane only when it's present, plus the signaling receptors, then nodal can bind to the cell and actually induce a signal. <coughs> So it's an essential cofactor that needs to be present on a cell that will be able to respond to a nodal signal. And we identified that this gene in the trick is expressed just in the right side. And its, it's, its expression is depending on different growth factors. We identified those growth factors, but it's also involved in cardiac looping. So here are some embryos depicted, and I try to highlight them. So this is a normal uh, right-sided looped myocardium. Here is one which did not loop at all, or here is one that looped to the contralateral side. So you can manipulate and determine the side where the heart is looping towards. And I think that's a great feeling. If you can manipulate an embryo and that will affect a, a massive morphogenetic step, that's a, it's a great feeling if you, if you exp, uh, experience this. But this also led then to another story which I will now expand a little bit on. <clears throat> because this factor is maintained and is expressed in the tubular myocardium, and then it's expressed in the, in, uh, anti, uh, it's the inflow and outflow areas of the myocardium, and it's maintained in a little ball of cells, which are called the poepicardium, and that leads to the next chapter in our research. What is this poepicardium? So the polypicardium is a very peculiar structure. It's a, it's a ball of cells that houses a number of stem cells of the myocardium. And depicted, it, it's here depicted how this polypicardium looks like. So this is a chick embryo about three days old. And this little ball of cells is just positioned here. This is now a blow up. <clears throat> and in this blow up, you can see this um, ball of cells that is here present at the inflow tract of the myocardium. And it's called the proepicardium, since it gives rise to the outer layer of the heart, which is called the epicardium.
So the poepicardium gives rise to the epicardium. Here we see how the, the cells then make contact to the myocardium. So initially we have this ball of cells. Then this ball of cells makes contact to the, surface, to the myocardial surface of the heart. And then it will migrate over it and subsequently completely insheat it with a new tissue layer. But that's not enough. It will do more. It will, for example, secrete then growth signals, which lead then to a massive proliferation of the so-called compact layer myocardium, which is then very important to generate a myocardium that is powerful to um, supply the, the, the organism with oxygens and nutrients when the embryo is growing. And that all depends on this outer layer of cells. If they are not there, we, the heart won't grow and the embryo will die. But not only that, those cells, the, the epicardium that is formed, will then give rise to a population of cells which are called the epicardium-derived cells, which become mesenchymal, migrate into the myocardial wall, and then establish the coronary artery system, and also the fibroblast and some other cell types of the myocardium. Work in my lab, for example, by Jan Schlüter, who is in the audience, looks a bit different now, but we'll have another, pro uh, figure, another picture of him, um, for example, then studied the role of BMP in the formation of the proepicardium. I don't want to go into detail, but he was able to show that BMP is also important, not only for heart formation, but also for the formation of the proepicardium. Another study was done by Angela Torlop, who is also in the audience, and she studied the role of the fibroblast growth factor uh, and what, what its role might be in the formation of the proepicardium, and she was able to show that fibroblast growth factor is very important to, for the growth of the structure. So when you interfere with FGF signaling, then the uh, proepicardium remains in a very small uh, uh, state and actually will mostly die then because of apoptosis. So FGF is important for maintaining and leading to growth of the proepicardium, while BMP is mostly involved in the determining the identity of the um, epicardium. A uh, really very exciting observation, uh, and I was made aware of this fact by uh, my friend uh, Jörg Menner, is that the proepicardium is an asymmetric structure, so it's only formed on the right side of the inflow tract. So that you can see that here. So only on the right side you see this ball of cells. There's a little bit of uh, uh, proepicardial-like cells on the left side, but they never really um, uh, make it, and there's never any contribution from the left side to the myocardium. So this left-right asymmetry, of course, is something I find always very interesting, and we started to study what might be the determination factors for the distribution on the left or the right side of the embryo. And um, <clears throat> Jan showed that it's an FGF snail pathway, which is activated on the right side that sends out a positive signal determining the positioning of the proepicardium on the right side of the inflow tract. This finding led then to further conclusions, which, again, the time is not sufficient to explain, but clearly what we were able then to find out is that the difference is on, that there is only a formation on the right side of the embryo and no formation on the left side is probably due to some inherent differences between the left and right side in cell mobilization from the so-called somatopleura, which is a part of the lateral plate mesoderm, which normally makes the um, outer body uh, uh, skin and the, peri the um, pericardium. But some of these cells actually start to migrate, and these uh, have been here by electroporation labeled in green, and these, you can see how these cells migrate from this tissue here all, the, all into the proepicardium itself. And that's a very new finding because it suggests that there is obviously formation of the structure by different cell populations. And we do not know yet what the importance of this finding is. This is just illustrating this again. So there's a connection between the two tissue layers here. And we have evidence for an asymmetric migration of cells from the right side at much higher levels than from the left side. And um, <clears throat> This is probably evolutionary, very, a very old system, 
And now we, of course, wonder what the purpose might be. We call them um, for epicardial um, uh, founder cells that, that may then actually lead to the formation. And since there is a much higher contribution on the right than on the left side, this may be the cause for the massive growth of the poepicardium on the right sinus. Okay, from here now, we'll leave the basic developmental biology, and all of a sudden we will get into a, um, a topic which is more interesting for adult cardiologists, and this deals with the so-called Popeye domain-containing gene family. We cloned those genes, <clears throat> again, initially in the chick embryo, by looking for differentially expressed genes that are at high level in the myocardium and low, at low levels anywhere elsewhere. And we did for that purpose a differential screening approach using first a PCR-driven um, enrichment in, in heart, heart enrichment, uh, enriched CDNA populations. And then by a differential hybridization, we were able to identify clones that are differentially expressed in, in the heart and then through further confirmation steps, we were able to identify genes that uh, showed a high level of expression in the myocardium. Among these was the Popeye um, domain-containing proteins, which kept us busy since then. So we never turned back to those other genes that there were in, in the screen. We always worked then on those Popeye genes. This is the initial first paper that has been published by Birgit Andre here at her um, PhD thesis um, disputation. We in Germany always give them funny heads when they finish their PhD, and that's that's a moment when she got her PhD. Um, <clears throat> the POP disease are actually a gene family consisting of three genes: POP DC1, POP DC2, POP DC3. POP DC1 has been also independently isolated by my friend uh, David Bader, <clears throat> and he has called this gene Beavis. In invertebrates, we have a usually a single uh, gene present, or sometimes there's also uh, two genes, um, like in certain butterflies. But usually we have a situation in insects of a single gene, which then is duplicated, so you get two genes in lower chordates, like this um, uh, lower chordate, Siona intestinalis, which is uh, at the base of chordate evolution, has already a primitive heart, and has already two of these POPTC genes. While in vertebrates, we have three genes, POPTC1, POPTC2, and POPTC3. Be it a fish, a mouse, or a chicken, they all have three of these genes. And they all have a configuration of a tandem of two genes adjacent to each other on one chromosomal locus and a single gene on a different chromosomal locus. The genes are highly conserved in their expression, so they are expressed early in cardiac development. Here is depicted expression in a fish, in a frog, in a chick, and in the mouse. And here are depicted expression patterns, and you see that the expression is always in the, in the muscle and always in the heart. So there's a um, certain strong association in the expression with striated muscle. It's not confined to striated muscle, but these are the areas of the highest expression. The the mRNA encodes a protein um, of about 40, 45 kilodalton, and we found that this is a membrane protein family, and actually the protein forms a dimer, which is stabilized by a disulfide bridge, and the protein runs at a much higher molecular weight of about 60 kilodalton because of a high level of glycosylation. So there's a sugar moiety of about 50 kilodalton um, at the extracellular part of the protein, which has only about uh, 20, um, peptide of 20 amino acids which are sitting outside the cell, the three transmembrane domain, and the major part is this highly conserved Popeye domain, which of course puzzled me because it was highly conserved and you can identify any member in any species by the sequence conservation in this area, but it was clearly not clear what, what is the purpose of this Popeye domain. Well, we, we found that out. I skip, sorry. <laughs> I'm skipping that now and go back later. Now I'm missing up the whole talk. Where is it? Yeah. Because what we found was that the Popeye domain is a conserved structure, and when you model it, you will find that this, this 
um, protein is a cyclic AMP binding protein, which was a stunning finding. And I still remember this moment when, when I was convinced that must be it. Here is a comparison of the secondary structure of POPDC1, which is Beavis, and protein kinase A. And you can see that they have a very similar distribution of alpha helices, uh, which are the, 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 the um, violet structures here, and then the beta strands, which are those little yellow arrows, highly similar in the secondary structure. And you can also do a modeling uh, using specialized so, uh, <coughs> uh, software in three dimensions, and you can still see there's a high uh, similarity. So this looks like popeye domain can bind cyclic AMP. And we tested that by incubating um, um, hard extracts with cyclic AMP agarose, and then incubating them. Popeye proteins, if they bind cyclic AMP, will bind to this matrix. And then you can spin that, and if Popeye is really binding, it will be all in the pellet, and only little of the protein will be staying in the supernatant. And that's exactly what occurred. You see here, this is a pellet, and this is supernatant. So most of the protein is actually in this fraction, which means Popeye can bind at high, high affinity to cyclic AMP. And you can compete, compete the binding by adding cyclic AMP, because the more cyclic AMP you add, the more of the brown protein you can actually release from the protein. From the, from the bead. All right, not enough. We proved the binding also by using recombinant protein um, in a collaboration with Slava Nikolaev. <clears throat> now in Göttingen, we, can, we were able to show that there is a high affinity for, for this Popeye protein for cyclic AMP. The activity, the binding affinity is almost as high as that of protein kinase A suggesting that this is a very specific uh, cyclic AMP binding protein. And it's also able to discriminate between cyclic AMP and cyclic GMP, which is also a typical sign for um, um, a cyclic AMP binding protein that it's able with about a tenfold different in affinity to bind specifically to um, cyclic AMP. So getting back, <coughs> where are those proteins localized? They are localized at the cell membrane. Of course, as a membrane protein, they should be in the, at the cell membrane. But they're also showing this striation here, which particularly you can see in the ventricular cardiac myocytes and lesser in those atrial myocytes. And this is due to the fact that they are also localized in the T-tubules. The T-tubules are membrane invagination, helping to efficiently couple excitation and contraction uh, by forming a, a nice complex with the sarcoplasmatic reticulum. But they are also signaling centers, so many proteins, many channels, many um, receptors like the beta adrenergic receptors are localized actually in the T-tubules. And, and you can see here that in those T-tubules there uh, are these aggregates, and we feel that these are probably centers where there's a high level of POP protein in those cardiac myocytes, and we would be very interested to find out the neighborhoods, what is, what is actually in the direct, in those complexes where POP is protein and might be localized. Shown here is also that the same expression pattern you see in the human heart as you see in the, um, <clears throat> in the mouse heart. So we then started to do knockouts because we had no clue what those proteins are doing. We knew about cyclic AMP binding a bit later, so initially we only did a knockout just to find out what is the function of those proteins, which actually was not a very good idea because the knockout resulted in a, in a, a null mutant that is alive. And then, well, I mean, it's very hard to find out what's wrong with an animal if it's alive, unless you are a cardiologist, um, which luckily we, we found somebody that collaborated with us. This is just show you the principle. We introduced a LAC-Z reporter gene into the first coding exon. And then you can nicely follow the expression domain in the resulting embryos, and you can easily see that the heart shows a very high level of expression, but there's also a high level of expression in striated muscle and also in smooth muscle-containing tissues. But it's viable, so what to do? Well, in the meantime, we moved to the University of Würzburg, and there we did the next knockout. We thought, well, maybe one is not sufficient, maybe you need to knock out more than one. So we then generated 
um, the property C2 non-mutant in the same way, and this is the Lag Z expression pattern showing here uh, the expression of the muscle done by Sascha Fröse, and again, the non-mutant is viable. That was pretty, pretty disappointing, because I mean, as a developmental biologist, you need a dead, dead uh, embryo, because then you can find out what's wrong. If the animal survives, it becomes a subject of physiology, which as a developmental biologist, you're not really good at, at least we think we are not. Um, but we found then people to collaborate with us. Um, this is just more of those expression patterns illustrating expression in striated muscle, smooth muscle, and in certain epithelial cells. What was very important was the finding that despite the heart shows a very high level of expression, there are certain areas that show an even higher level of expression. One of this is here, this little dot here, and then around here. And these two areas are the sinus and AV node, which are the pacemaker, the primary and the secondary pacemaker of the myocardium. This is also depicted here, where we nicely see that there's a high level of expression um, in the sinus node. Well, what is the sinus node and what is the AV node? Those that are developmental biologists and do not work um, on electrophysiology may not know. Well, these are, the, as I said, the primary and secondary pacemakers of the heart being present at the inflow tract, the sinus node, and between the atria and the ventricle, which is the site of the AV node. And, and these two um, pieces of tissue are very primitive and are able to spontaneously induce electrical activation, leading then first to the electrical activation of the atria by the activity of the sinus node, and then the AV node then results in the electrical activation of the ventricle. Well, this expression then, um, we were able to contact cardiologists and we got hold of two very nice ones, Larissa Fabritz and Paulus Kirchhoff, at that time working at the University of Münster. They are now actually neighbors. They have moved to the University of Birmingham. And with them, we did some analysis of the electrical activity of the, of the mouse heart. Um, depicted here is an implantation of one of those telemetric ECG um, monitor systems. And shown here is the heart rate of a resting mouse. Both the wild type and the mutant do show some circadian rhythm alterations, but there's no obvious um, difficult, any difference at the as a, at baseline. The thing becomes completely different the moment you subject those animals to stress. The experiment done here is to subject the animals to just five minutes of physical activity by placing them into body warm water, let them swim for five minutes, which is this blue period here. And this is sufficient to make a big difference for a, for a mutant pop DC2 mouse. Because what happens is that the heart rate that normally is around 500, normally shoots up to 700 under stress. While in the mouse mutant, this is no long, is not a, the animal is not able to maintain this high level of, of um, um, heart rhythm. But actually it goes up and down, goes up and down. And even then when you take the mouse out and keep it outside to, for some time of rest, you still have this high heart rate variability. The heart rate variability is due to the spontaneous pausing of the sinus node. So there are, there are pauses then that are differently long and occurring spontaneously, but all this is only present when you subject those animals to stress. So under baseline conditions, the mouse is completely fine. What is even worse and made our life very difficult initially is that the phenotype develops in an age-dependent manner. So in a young mouse, the phenotype isn't there. And so these are... Um, a phenotype analysis of the same animal that was tested at three, five, and eight months of age. And you can see that the phenotype develops over time and is particularly present when the animals get eight months old. What is even more surprising is the same phenotype is present in the other mouse mutants. So this is the same data all appearing almost like a duplication, but it's a completely different mouse. This poppy C1 is in a different chromosomal locus, and both are alive, but both have the stress-dependent bradycardia phenotype, 
which almost lo looks indistinguishable um, and also shows the same age dependency. So both mouse mutants are age de develop an age-dependent stress-induced bradycardia. What could be the reason for that? Well, one hypothesis which we would propose is that there are structural de degenerative changes occurring in the sinoatrial node. These are hormone stainings for a protein marker that labels the, the cell membrane of sinus node cells. And these are hormone stained uh, preparations. And you can clearly see this wide area of sinus node identity in the, my, in the mouse myocardium. <clears throat> While in the mutant, you see that particularly in this lower part, there's a reduction in staining. And all, overall, the staining pattern looks clearly much different from what you see in the wild type. This is a three-dimensional reconstruction of these structures where you see this wide area of sinus node structure in the wild type, and then this massive loss of sinus node cells in the posterior part of the myocardium. The interpretation of that phenotype I come at the end. So we talked already about the cyclic AMP binding, so I can skip that, and come to another property, which is that those proteins, of course, cannot act on their own. I mean, yes, they can bind cyclic AMP, they sit in the membrane, but what they do, they need some interaction partners. And luckily enough, when I was in Würzburg, I had a friend from my previous lab that I met, and he was a neurophysiologist, and his name is Gerhard Wischmeier, and he had a favorite ion channel called TREK1, and TREK1 happened to be an interacting protein, which is um, pure luck, but it proved to be very interesting. So TREK1 is a two-port channel. It's a potassium channel that is, is most of the time open, but under certain stimulation, like adrenergic agonist treatment, the channel can close. Its property as a pore of potassium, and potassium can be um, released from the cell actually determines the um, excitability of the cell in which track is expressed because I mean the more potassium um, is flowing out of the cell the lower is the resting membrane potential. When we co-express POP with track in xenopus oocytes we see that the, uh, <clears throat> the current that is actually generated by the ion channel is doubled in the presence of POP. And this property of enhancing channel activity of TREK1 is present for POPDC1, POPDC2, and POPDC3 data that we got from another collaborator, Niels Stecher. Moreover, Roland Schindler in the lab was able to show that the two proteins are actually um, <coughs> interacting and you can do uh, um, co-immunoprecipitations um, or in this case, GST pull-down experiments to demonstrate a, a specific interaction of POP and TREK1. And then the really key experiment was one where we had, again, help of Slava Nikolaev together with Ulan Schindler. They did a, a FRET experiment, so, and Slava, or you know him, is very good in, in FRET essays. So what, he, what we did was we, we placed um, a CFP uh, moiety on, uh, on POP and a YFP moiety on track. And when those two are getting close enough together, then there is an um, energy tr um, transport from the one to the other. And when you do an activation of the blue one, you also see then some emission of, of yellow light. And that's the principle of this uh, FRET um, technology. And what has been done then was that we incubated cells um, just in the presence of cell line and then added isopoterinol, which leads then to an activation of adenylate cyclase and an increase in cyclic AMP levels of the cell. And what you can see is then a massive drop here in the fluorescence, suggesting that binding of cyclic AMP modulates the interaction of the um, uh, interaction between the two proteins. And this is specific because we utilized also a mutant of POP that is no longer able to bind cyclic AMP. And under these conditions, the addition of isopoterinol had no impact whatsoever. So this suggests that the protein interaction between this channel and POP may be cyclic AMP modulated, which could be a way in which the whole system works, that POP acts as a switch to modulate the activity of ion channels with which it's interacting. <clears throat> 
All this has now been uh, depicted uh, now, which is a, a great thing, by an editorial of Vincent Christoffels, which is now appearing in JCI. So we can depict now the, the sort that we have, pop interacts with track under baseline conditions. If we now increase the level of cyclic AMP, the two proteins are made separate. This leads then to a less uh, uh, um, a transport of uh, potassium, and that may be the whole story. We don't know. It could be also that a completely different thing is happening because, I mean, as I showed you, the sinus node structure is clearly altered, and it could also be that the loss of uh, sinus node tissue at the posterior part of the sinus node is all what it takes because it's known that, exactly that adenergic stimulation leads to a modulation of the, the, the localization of the uh, primary pacemaker within the sinus node. There could be, uh, there's normally more in the upper part of the, of the sinus node and under adenergic stimulation, the site of ignition is actually moving uh, downwards. And it could be that the loss of tissue in this area would lead then to a specific failure of the sinus node um, to uh, pace the myocardium because those tissue is gone in the mutant. And also this would be an, an explanation and we need to distinguish uh, between these possibilities by further work. This is a paper, you can all have a look. We know now that this whole story is more complex. We have now in collaboration with Cesare Terragiano began to isolate cardiac myocytes from the mutants, and this is work by Sabrina Simrick in the lab. And the first data are pretty encouraging because we see also in ventricular myocytes electrical alterations. We see early after depolarizations, uh, delayed after depolarizations, and also, what is it called, um, APD, action potential alternance with a significant uh, presence in uh, mutant animals, suggesting that despite that we do not see any uh, direct effect on the ECG in the isolated cell, we see already alterations also in the ventricular uh, myocytes. So suggesting that the entire electrical system is probably dependent on POP function. This is also true when the mice get even older, when the mice get double at, uh, as old, 16 months of age, which is still not the end of the life of a mouse, but what you see then is that all sorts of ventricular um, um, arrhythmias are present in those mutant animals. Even we found cases of uh, ventricular fibrillations under these conditions, which is a rather rare phenotype in mice because of the high beating rate. All that is only present when you subject the animals to stress. So under baseline conditions, the animals are fine. In the moment you subject them to stress, they develop these kind of phenotypes, which is a very interesting thing and perfectly fits, of course, with the biochemical property of a cyclic AMP binding protein. Well, we did also some work on the zebrafish, which is also the reason behind is that those waiting for eight months that the phenotype develops is certainly a, a hard situation to, to progress in, in study. So we use the zebrafish as a surrogate system to get an idea what's actually happening. And Bettina Kirchmeier in the lab uh, pioneered this work by studying POPDC2. And now this work is overtaken by Kalai Poon, which will also characterize the function of the other family members. We see also a cardiac arrhythmia in zebrafish, shown here. Are um, with an optical recording system, different uh, AV blocks and a bradycardia phenotype. But what I wanted to sh really show you are those um, SPIM um, uh, videos here. SPIM microscopy, which has been done by Jan Husken in the lab of Didier Stagnier. And what you see here in green is the inner lining of the, of the heart, the endocardium. You see here also the, the valve that opens up and uh, closes. And in red, you see the blood cells that are transported here from the atria to the ventricle, to the outflow tract, and here are the drills. And here is one of the, uh, of a, uh, this is a morphant. So we injected here a morpholino that t knocks down the expression of POPDC2. And what you can nicely see here is um, a, um, 
um, that the heart then shows all sorts of cardiac arrhythmias um, and a complete standstill once in a while. And of course, we want to know now uh, the underlying electrophysiology, and that's something we hope to develop with um, Cesare and also with Peter Cole. We hope to get an idea what is the underlying, um, um, underlying cause for this phenotype. Just to end the whole lecture, um, uh, to give you a perspective whether this has any role whatsoever in the human, clearly we have evidence that the genes are modulated in their expression under disease. So this is experiments that have been done in Ganya kessler itzekson's lab in Israel. And she has studied the level of um, POP-DC expression um, in failing hearts. And you can see here that, uh, that there are certain patients which are rather low level of expression in the left ventricle and even lower level here in the atria. And clearly, if you have such a low level of expression, then certainly you are at high risk to develop the kind of phenotype that we see in the mice, a stress-induced arrhythmia, which would be something that is anyway observed in failing patients. And it could be that POP would be a determinant for this phenotype, something to find out. Of course, we're also looking for mutations in patients uh, and, and this is work that's ongoing, and I don't want to comment on that here. <clears throat> so I'm ending here with uh, 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 acknowledging the work. This is the current team. I named uh, most of the people already, uh, and these are the many different collaborators. I'm sure I didn't mention Jörg Menner here, and many others. I, uh, I forgot. This is not. This is simply my my mistake. And. I thank you and I thank the Imperial and Marky Jakub for financing my move to uh, England and the DFG which funded part of that work that I've shown you. Thank you very much. <laughs>